Good morning, everyone. Can we have everyone please take their seats? Please. We'll see if they listen. Perfect. I believe we have oh, we're up front. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Super excited to have everyone here in the building. Um, if you could all please take your seats so we can get started. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much for coming to what is the first ever Military Spouse Appreciation Day event here at Labor. Uh, my name is Carla Langham and I have the honor of serving as Chief of Staff here at the Department of Labor Veterans Employment Training Service. Uh, today could not be possible with our amazing colleagues uh, who put this together. I'm looking at Mark Toll, wherever he is. Um, thank you all so much for bringing this to life. Um, so for over a year, DL Vets has been working tirelessly with the help of the Secretary's Office to identify the levers at labor that can be pulled to help combat the 21% unemployment rate military spouses are facing. Um, Vets is incredibly thankful to the Secretary's Office who has always showed their unwavering support. Acting Secret Secretary Sue has always been such a huge supporter of Vets and working with us. So we are so happy with all the the support that we get to help veterans, transitioning service members, military members, and military spouses find meaningful careers. Um, as someone who has worked with the military community for the last 10 years, I know firsthand that to achieve meaningful change is going to have to take intentional collaboration. Thank you all for being here today. I, I have the honor of introducing my boss, Assistant Secretary James Rodriguez, uh, the Department of Labor's Veteran Employment Training Services, uh, Assistant Secretary, oh my gosh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez is a retired Marine with executive leadership experience in the federal and private sectors. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez is a combat veteran along with two tours as a Marine Corps drill instructor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. This is an important conversation, as you all know, because you wouldn't be here if it wasn't, right? And the reason I say it's important is because of the fact that uh, we were speaking specifically about military spouses. Now, how often does an organization really speak specifically about military spouses and actually do something about what we're talking about? That's the most important piece of it, right? As we're not only speaking about it, we're trying to do something that we know will be life-changing to our military spouse community. And for that, I cannot thank our team enough. And it's actually started, I'll give you a quick uh, history lesson on this, how this whole conversation started within labor. It's something that should have been done a long time ago, honestly. We all know that, right? We know historically that these things have been needed. These um, protections for military spouses have been needed for a long time. But the conversation really started uh, in earnest when our former Secretary of Labor, Secretary Walsh, him and I visited Joint Base Lewis McCord out in Washington. And we had a round table. We had a round table with military spouses. It was his first round table that he was gonna have on a base with military spouses. And I was with them. And he looked at me and he said, James, what do I need to know when I go into this room with military spouses? And I said, here's the one thing that you need to pay attention to. If you ask a military spouse a question, expect them to give you the answer that you may not be expecting because they're going to tell you the truth. Right? And he's like, OK. Sure enough, we get into the room. After the spouses got warmed up to the secretary being there and him asking questions, it didn't take long for them to really tell him what was happening across the entire military spouse community and the landscape on things that they actually had challenges with when it came to employment. A lot of great information that came out of that. After we finished, the secretary looked at me and said, what can we do? Can we do something? I said, of course, sir, we can do something. And uh, he goes, give me a plan in a month. I want to visit. Uh, I want to hear about this plan, and let's do something to protect our military spouses. So I came back from that trip, as I usually do with our, from all my trips, and I go to the team, and I said, look, this is what happened. This is what we have to do. And then 
We brought the team together, and fortunately, I've got a phenomenal team of super smart people, passionate about it, who actually this resonates with on top of the work that they do. This resonates with them because many of them had military spouses while they are on active duty as well. So they felt the personal impact of what we can do here and how it would affect their spouses and them personally. And so they took it on with the passion that uh, I can tell you is still there almost, well, probably a year, a little more than a year into doing this. And so for that, I'm grateful for the team that I get to work with every day. So on top of that, it's not something new that VETS has been doing for a while. Uh, when I say we're now trying to protect military spouses. When it comes to what we've been doing over the last couple of years to support our military spouse community, we have numerous programs that oftentimes people are not aware of. For example, we have a transition employment assistance for military spouse program that has 10 courses that are virtual that the spouses can take at any time that they want to, whether it's after hours, whether they take it one at a time, or they stop, they take a pause, and they take it again. The reason that's important, because we know they have daily challenges also. Some of them are working, some of them have child care, uh, that children that they have to take, of, take care of, we know that getting them to child care is also a challenge for our military spouses, just like it is in general for our, our community writ large, right? But one of the things most people don't realize is that the military spouse unemployment rate is at 21%. Think about that. We're doing a good job as a country of getting our unemployment rate down. So our unemployment rate for military spouses is at 21%. And it's been like that consistently for over the last few years. So looking at how can we affect that unemployment rate in a positive way is something we are trying to do here at Department of Labor. And then the other things I wanted to point out here. So I've got a whole list of things. My team is phenomenal of things that I'm supposed to talk about. But as usual, I'm going to speak about a few of them, right? And, uh, and then make sure that we leave opportunities for questions in, the, in, the, in our panel. But think about this. Junior enlisted spouses, and some of these things you all are aware of, but I want to reiterate, junior enlisted spouses are more likely to be unemployed because they are transitioning to new environments. They are new to the military, so they do not have a clear understanding yet of the military mechanism when it comes to uh, employment and as they transition to duty stations. Spousal support for the military community was now, is now at 49% down from 56% reported in a 2019 survey. So military spouses are no longer looking at the military community as a place for them for the longevity of someone's career, right? Because of all the challenges associated with that. All this data is uh, out there. And so it points to the fact that we have to do something. And also, one of the other things that's important is 25% of military spouses reported being food insecure. Who would have thought that, right? 25% of military spouses reported being food insecure. On top of that, the importance for dual military incomes is really important when you talk about the lack of financial stability if someone loses their job. If that spouse loses their job, now that 25% is gonna go up, right? The challenge is gonna be even more exacerbated, especially in high um, cost of living states. And so we know we have a lot of service members serving in high cost of living areas, but the cost of living does not keep up with what the military community needs to support themselves, especially if that dual income is lost. I talked about the TEAMS program that we have. One of the other programs we have is called the Off-Base Transition Training Program that's been in pilot stage that uh, the uh, ranking member is very, very familiar with and who actually uh, brought into legislation for us to execute. And I'm proud to say we've done a good job with off-base transition training program where spouses, along with our veterans, can get resources after they left the military. Same type of resources that they could have had while they're on active duty through the transition assistance program. Those programs are doing exceptionally well. We have a lot of growth uh, opportunities in those areas. And we're only in a few states because it is indeed a pilot. And our goal is to make sure that those programs continue to grow. On top of that, last year, 340 military spouses utilize our Employment Navigator program, our partnership pilot program, rather. And that is in itself another partner, or pilot, another program that uh, the ranking member has supported. And because of the fact that we know how successful that program has been in partnership with all the resources that are being executed in TAP, we know how effective the Employment Navigator partnership pilot program has been to date, not only for our veterans, but our military spouses. And one of the things I always do is encourage our military spouses to participate in the transition assistance program when they have the opportunity because of the fact that there are so much resources shared in those programs. And we all know it. 
uh, as uh, the chief of staff mentioned, I was a Marine for 21 years, and I'll be the first one to admit, I didn't tell my wife everything when it came to the courses that I was uh, in, the things I learned in these courses, right? And so we know if the spouses are in these programs, they will learn and they'll see things in a different light than that veteran will or that service member will. And so we want to make sure that they have that information to make an informed decision when they're preparing for that transition out of the military, whether they did four years or 20 years. On top of that, one of the things that we are doing is we're looking to protect our military spouses through, um, through the information that you're going to get here today. So I apologize for that. It's a brief that you're going to re get from uh, uh, Paul Barone, who's our senior policy advisor. He's going to provide a brief on how we are looking at ways to protect our military spouses. And the reason that's important, again, is that we know you're going to hear numerous stories up here on how a change in duty station, how someone's deployment, whether they're recalled to active duty or guard service, someone's deployment while they're on active duty can affect that entire uh, family. I can give you stories upon stories of I've, that I've had with spouses themselves since I've been in office over the last two and a half years on how this has affected them uh, not only personally, but for the future of their career advancement. So think about this. If a spouse loses a job and then he or she moves across the country, they're losing that job every three years if they stay in for one, 20 years. What have they done? They've lost the opportunity to have investments. They've lost the opportunity to have long-term career growth in many cases because they change careers based off of what's available at their duty stations. On top of that, they haven't been able to consistently have an investment in their 401ks, in their retirement plans. So think about the long-term impact on that family when they haven't had the ability to build a nest egg for their own retirement. And so we know how important that is to the family's well-being post-military service. And so what we also know is programs that we have in place can actually support generational change and generational wealth as we continue to grow within these programs and as an organization within the Department of Labor, we are looking to make sure that our spouses are committed or we are committed to support our military spouses. I also believe so much in it that when I came to office two and a half years ago, I adjusted our vision statement. Our vision statement used to say, enabling all service members, transitioning service members, veterans, to reach their full potential in the workplace. But what we did is we changed it to include military spouses. So now it says, enabling all transitioning service members, veterans, and military spouses to reach their full potential in the workplace. And so we've been doing these programs for a long time, so it's nothing new that I've uh, brought to the table. But what we did is reinvest in our spousal community and the programs that we have to support them through numerous programs that I mentioned today. And so with partnerships across the entire federal government, our partners at DOD, the VA, and of course our partners, uh, partnerships with uh, members on the Hill, both the House and the Senate side, we look to do great things for our military spouses. So what I want to do now, I want to invite uh, Congressman Levin to join us up here shortly. But sir, let me give you, let me give you your kudos, though, because it's important. And so Congressman Levin represents the California's 49th Congressional District, which includes most of northern coastal San Diego County, to include Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, a place I am uh, very, very familiar with because I did my last deployment out of there with Fox 24, I have to admit, uh, in 2008. And uh, he has been a staunch, staunch supporter of what DOL Vets does at our mission. And we've testified in front of him uh, a few times since I've been in office because of the fact that uh, he believes in what we do and he's supported in what we do. So, Congressman, I can't thank you enough for all of that support. He is a ranking member of the House Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity and has legislative oversight, investigative jurisdiction over the education of our veterans, the employment and training of veterans, vocational rehabilitation, veterans housing programs, including our veterans homelessness programs, and the military to civilian transition services. So to say he, he uh, does a lot and has an investment in our veteran community is an understatement. So we sincerely appreciate the Congressman for joining us today. Well, thank you. Good morning. I appreciate that uh, kind introduction uh, and uh, accept uh, the uh, compliments on behalf of uh, our great team. Uh, I know Julian is here from the House Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, excuse me, Justin is here. Julian used to be on the House Veterans Affairs Committee. We miss him very much. 
Uh, but where's Justin? He's here somewhere. So Justin, if you don't know him, and then my Deputy Chief of Staff, Faith Williams, does an amazing job in our office working on these issues. Uh, and uh, just know this is an area where we can still get things done as uh, you know, polarizing and partisan and crazy as Washington, D.C. can be and as crazy as the Congress can be. Uh, when it comes to our veterans and our military spouses, uh, we still can do big things when we work together. And I'd like to think every day should be uh, Military Spouses Appreciation Day. That's certainly how it is in, uh, in our district uh, with Camp Pendleton, all our great uh, Marines and sailors uh, and uh, everyone else there as part of the community. I've had the honor of representing the 49th District since 2019, uh, and I had the great pleasure of serving as chair of the Economic Opportunity Subcommittee, and now I'm the ranking member of that subcommittee. We do conduct oversight over DOL vets, and that we appreciate all the times we've, uh, we've called you down the street. Uh, but we're really excited to be working in a collaborative fashion to strengthen benefits and protections for service members and their families. Uh, I think it's clear to everybody here, military spouses have some of the most difficult roles in our nation's defense, uh, which is why there's a longstanding commitment from Democrats and Republicans to support them. Both Democratic and Republican presidents have signed important laws to help spouses, just a few examples of that. President George H.W. Bush signed the Military Family Act of 1985, which established an Office of Family Policy within the Office of the Secretary of Defense and authorized DOD to survey uh, military family members. President Bush signed an executive order in 2008 to allow swifter hiring of spouses in federal agencies and signed the Military Spouses Residency Relief Act in 2009 to allow spouses to maintain their residency and their voting rights in a state where they live before permanent change of station. 2010, President Obama directed his national security staff to develop a government-wide approach to supporting military families. His office designated career and educational opportunities for military spouses as one of the four priority areas. And in January of this year, President Biden signed my bill, I have to give a shout out, the Veterans Auto and Education Improvement Act, which included protections to allow military spouses to bring their professional licenses with them when they are moving under military orders. And I've just heard that we're expecting some excellent guidance coming very soon, some specifics for our, our uh, spouses on base. I'd actually visited uh, with Vice President Harris at Camp Pendleton when I first got to Congress, and we met with a group of military spouses I was mentioning to, to the spouses you're going to be hearing from in a minute. And this was probably the biggest thing for them, was that the professional licenses, the certifications that they I had worked very hard for the career path that they had chosen that they could go from state to state and have those licenses transfer over. So this is a very big deal. But there's still a lot more we have to do, obviously. In March, our subcommittee held a hearing titled Examining the Future of Workforce Protections for Service Members. And at that hearing, we discussed the need to provide employment protections for military spouses. The Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, which you may know as USERA, is one of the bedrock laws that ensure service members aren't punished professionally for their commitment to our nation's defense. We've got to strengthen these protections. Building upon the Veterans Reemployment Rights Act, Congress passed USERA to ensure that no one service member loses their job, is discriminated against, or is otherwise penalized in their civilian career because they've answered the call of duty. It's the very least we can do. That provides critical job protections to those who serve our country and encourages employers to support and respect the sacrifices that are made by our service members. Over one million service members are now eligible for USERA protections, without which our all-volunteer force likely wouldn't be possible. However, there are many gaps that remain in the law, including the fact that it doesn't cover military spouses. That's why our committee is actively working on legislation to cover military spouses and their families under USERA. Our committee's proposal would expand some of these essential protections for service members to their spouses, and in the process, define military spouses to cover all partnerships and all unions. We've also worked to support military spouses beyond the confines of our committee's jurisdiction. Last year, a Navy veteran and constituent, constituent of ours brought to my attention that the Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't measure military spousal unemployment. Well, the Department of Defense conducts a survey every two years. It's only a snapshot and isn't useful for conducting uh, the or comparing the unemployment rate over time. Understanding the scope 
of military spousal unemployment is critical for us to effectively tackle it. Seems pretty straightforward. That's why I worked with the Appropriations Committee to push the Department of Defense and the Bureau of Labor Statistics to collaborate on better capturing this data. Another way I'm working to improve military spouse employment is by co-sponsoring the Military Spouse Hiring Act, which would expand the work opportunity tax credit to employers that hire military spouses. We've got to make it uh, the new normal that we want all of our private employers to, to be hiring military spouses. The bottom line is that appreciating military spouses is much more than saying thank you one day every year, although that is nice, right, to say thank you, but I think we should say thank you every day. It's really about implementing policies that will recognize their sacrifices by tangibly improving their lives. It's ongoing work, it's important work. Not only is it the right thing to do for our military spouses, it's the right thing to do for our national security. We must do it for our national security. It's no secret that federal services are not meeting their recruitment goals. I think we all know this. For example, the Army National Guard only managed 66% of their goal for the last fiscal year. So by strengthening supports for a service member's entire family, and oh, by the way, that includes their children as well, and we're working very hard on that, we can attract more recruits to answer the call to serve our nation. So I look forward to continuing that work, very importantly, in a bipartisan fashion. The new chairman of our subcommittee is Derek Van Orden of Wisconsin. I hope you all get a chance to meet Derek. Notwithstanding, I hope I get my gavel back one of these days. Uh, but Derek joined me in San Diego last week, and we had a great hearing on ending veteran homelessness, so critically important. But I am confident, and I, I mean this sincerely, for all that you hear and all that you read, or if you watch cable news, God help you, but all that you hear about this town, in the last four plus years, this is an area where we have come together. This is an area where we've gotten results. And I'm grateful to have that opportunity to do that, to give back not only to those who are fighting, but those who are serving by uh, sacrificing their lives as spouses and the children as well. It, it's so critically important that we're all in this together. So I'm grateful to DOL vets, grateful to the staff, grateful to uh, each of you for the work that you're doing. Most grateful of all to the military spouses that you're gonna be hearing from shortly. Thank you all for having me. Okay, again, everyone, please round of applause for uh, Congressman Levin, all the great work he does for our military community, our families. As you can tell, he's passionate about what he does. He's been doing this for a while, and he has keen insight into the needs of our military community, and he is a big champion for what we do. So we're grateful for the opportunity to partner with him and uh, the support that he provides us. Next, I want to invite up uh, Anna Kelly, who is the Director of Communications for the Chairman of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity, Congressman Van Orden's uh, Director. So, Anna, please. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting the congressman to speak. Um, today, I um, unfortunately, I'm sad that I have to be here on his behalf, but he did have three committee hearings um, that he was required to attend. But um, like the secretary said, my name is Anna Kelly. Um, I am the communications director for Congressman Derek Van Orden. Um, and of course, as a retired Navy SEAL of 26 years, the um, taking care of our military spouses in, is incredibly close to his heart. So I know he's very sorry that he couldn't be here today. Um, but he did ask me to read this letter to you all now. While military service men and women are away serving our great na nation, military spouses have the difficult task of taking up the responsibility of their partners. As a retired U.S. Navy SEAL, I have experienced this sacrifice firsthand. I would like to thank my wonderful wife, Sarah Jane, uh, for standing with me while I was away for 26 years in combat zones fighting for America. Her dedication to our family enabled me to pursue what I was called to do in defending our great nation. She was the primary caregiver to our four children while I served on multiple combat deployments to Africa, Asia, Europe, South and Central America. 
Military service is among the very highest callings one can pursue. We cannot go fight for America without the support, time, and love of our brave spouses. And we must do more to support our military spouses. According to this department, 53% uh, of military spouses participated in the labor market compared to 76% of the general population. Moreover, 13% of military spouses are employed, that's three times the national average, and nearly half of military spouses, when asked, feel that they will not be able to maintain the same standard of living in retirement that they currently have. That is simply unacceptable. We must take action to ensure our military spouses and families are well taken care of. I promise to do everything I can to persuade my colleagues in the House of Representatives to join me in this commitment. Thank you to the Department of Labor for putting on this important event. I hope to be able to join you all next year. And to the military spouses in attendance, thank you for all you do. I salute you and have a fine Navy day. Thank you all. All right. So again, please join me in another round of applause for for Anna, representing the ranking member Van Orden. Uh, I had the good fortune of testifying in front of Van Orden, the chairman, uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, prior to the testimony, we're going to get to go up and speak to him a little bit and uh, talk about what uh, he wanted to get out of the hearing. And what he wanted to get was information on what USERRA is doing to protect our National Guard and our reserves, but also what can we do in the future of uh, protections of military spouses. How do we look to support our military spouse community? I was just related in the letter because he said himself, which Anna just read, that he had firsthand experience. And just like a lot of people in this room, a lot of people who are watching on TV have firsthand experience and they understand the value of what we are trying to do. They also understand the impact that it has on people's lives every day. And so because of that, we know we have a champion in the chairman and, uh, and in the committee up there because of the work that they have and they felt it firsthand. So we know how important that is to the work we do. So again, uh, Anna, please thank the chairman for uh, his remarks. We really wish we could have been here, but we appreciate you coming down also, so thank you. So with that, I want to invite our chief of staff back up to continue with the program. I messed it up, Mark, sorry. Um, so for the next portion of our program, we're going to invite our panelists up to the stage, please. Um, we have an incredible, diverse uh, panel this morning to, for them to share their stories with you. Um, so many different perspectives that they bring to the table. We have um, an exceptional family member up here. We have a foreign-born spouse. We have Angela, who I like to joke has uh, about a million like volunteer hours on every base that she's been on. And then we have our veteran spouse, um, Faye Hernandez, up here as well. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit more about my personal story as a military spouse. I was military spouse for 13 years. I moved 12 times during that time. But what I didn't realize was that the Department of Labor had so many resources to support military spouses. I could have set foot into an American job center at any moment, been assessed, and um, could have qualified for child care dollars. Now we all know how huge that is, that we can walk in and if you qualified, you could get child care dollars as well as upskilling and reskilling dollars for high demand um, occupations in that area. I also wanna um, talk about our employment benefits uh, security. Um, they also Google that, we talked a little bit about investing in our 401ks. Most military spouses like myself, I have 401ks kind of thrown about the country from all the different jobs that I've had. Um, they can really help you consolidate those and streamline a way to do it. Look it up, Google it. There are amazing things that are going on here, um, not only at VETS, but at other areas of DOL. So with that, I'm gonna hand that back over to the Assistant Secretary, thanks. All right, thank you, Carla. So well, can you guys hear me? Okay, perfect. So what we wanna do, again, is take a little bit of time to allow each panel member to introduce themselves, and then we'll get right into questions. How does that sound? Okay, Angela, over you. My name's Angela Neal, and I came in from Florida, so thank you for having me here today. And I've been a military spouse for 18 years and moved around the country, even overseas, and started over. So I have a myriad of experience, but I'm an expert at transferable skills as well. My name is Marco Schinella. Thank you uh, 
for having me here. I'm representing the foreign born military spouses. I was in the army myself. I'm from originally from Italy, uh, moved here four years ago, and I've been a military spouse for three years. Again, I represent the niche within the foreign within the military spouse, the foreign born military spouses. Uh, currently, currently employed here in DC. Um, I'm I'm positively uh, amazed of of all the attention that that in the in the community to military spouses, especially to foreign born military spouses, uh, we will have today the opportunity to speak about w the challenges that, that we face as foreign born military spouses coming from our own country to the US and facing all the challenges to establish here and to transfer our education, our experience here. So thanks again for having me here. Thanks so much, Mr. Secretary, to you and your whole team for having us, but also for everything that you do for military spouses. We really appreciate it. Um, my name's Faye Fernandez. Um, I'm an attorney and military spouse of, I was trying to calculate while you were talking, I think 15 years. Um, my husband's going to kill me if I got that wrong. But um, I currently work at um, the Senate VA Committee for Senator John Tester of Montana. Um, have been there for about four years. My husband was active duty Air Force. Um, he was a pilot for 14 years, um, and then I said I would like to work. <laughs> so um, he transitioned out and is now uh, full-time with the Maryland Air National Guard. So thank you so much for having me. I'm looking, for looking forward to um, the discussion. Thank you, Faye. Megan? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Megan Emmel. Um, I am a military spouse of only five years. Um, I anticipated it not being a long-term career, but it's looking that way. My husband is active duty Army. Um, I'm currently an educator, so I teach um, in the area. We are originally from Ohio, um, stationed at Fort Belvoir now, and I'm really happy to be here with all of you. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again for being here. And uh, Angela actually flew in from Florida, so... Uh, thank you again for flying in for this event because she thought that was important. One of the things that you mentioned was you spent a lot of hours volunteering, right? Military spouses in this room and on, t on, a, on a video spend thousands of, hour thousands of hours volunteering. And a lot of the bases we know cannot operate without their volunteer hours. But at the same time, that is not contributing to your overall financial well-being, right? But it's also not, in many cases, contributing to your career trajectory either, right? And so... We know you did a lot of that, and you moved duty station to duty station. How did that affect you from your career perspective, and what led you to found your own company? Mm -hmm. So for military spouses, well, and for the community, I think people naturally were very effective in getting things done. And so for the community, it's easy for people to lean on us and ask for us to do things, which is taking us away from other opportunities to get paid for employment. So if you think about the typical community, civilian community, that probably, it still happens in that community, but I think it's escalated with military spouses just because of the availability, because a lot of times we have trouble getting employed and so we have additional time. And what, for me, for volunteering, one, I love volunteering. It's the easiest way to quickly connect with the community and get integrated and give back. And I feel like it's really a bridge between the military and civilian community. And so I volunteered, of course, stateside, and we volunteered overseas and led a volunteer organization overseas. But what really stuck out to me was not necessarily my own situation, but other military spouses that were volunteering overseas were doctors, um, doctors, medical doctors, and they also were lawyers and a lot of people with MBAs and professional degrees that could not find employment, and they were volunteering. And so when you think about how these people are contributing back to the military community, but also how it's impacting their own career field. You can't really monetize when you, and you look at, you think about the value of volunteer work and you think you could, you know you can't do a job without those people, but when you're actually trying to monetize that work on a resume and you're trying to negotiate a pay, there's, there's no comparison. It's very difficult to do that for an employer and so, that, that's really a challenge with that component is leaning so much on the military spouse community that it's not helping contribute to the positive um, trajectory of their employment. Yeah, and 
I think a lot of military spouses could resonate with that all across the entire country because that affects them daily, still affecting them daily. One of the things that uh, the chief of staff mentioned when she came on and we were talking about uh, some of the things we wanted to do in our organization was uh, how can we really support military spouses? But one of the things she mentioned was when our spouses are not employed, they get educated. And the reason I say that is because oftentimes they look at more education as a way to help them prepare for their next career. One of those things, if you had the opportunity to read Marco's bio, is look at his education. A couple of master's degrees on top of that. Even though he was foreign born and foreign military, he was our allied country, but he actually was educated in some of our best military educational systems that we have in the U.S. as well. So taking all of that experience, his military experience, is still a challenge when he came to the U.S. to find a job, right, personally. So tell us a little bit about that. What was the challenge associated with your personal experience? Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Yeah. Um, so as Mr. Secretary said, uh, the challenge was moving here to the U.S. Uh, we, with some military background and military education, uh, and also education that I that I heard uh, overseas, uh, the the transferability of credentials and professional certification and education is is a major major challenge that a lot of foreign-born military spouses actually faces. Uh, a lot of the certification that we gain, also in Europe, I'm from Europe, not necessarily are completely transferred here uh, as the same value. So we go through uh, certification processes, which is costly and lengthy. And so by the time that we probably end up uh, having our certification uh, validated here, we need to move somewhere else. So for me, the biggest challenge was uh, as foreign-born military spouses, we're not also eligible for any clearance. So actually, none of the potential job that we could have from also government contractor, those are off of our list. Uh, we cannot, and we have great programs, fellowship programs that actually have uh, the, the give the opportunity to foreign-born military spouses as well to go through this program with, with corporation here in the US. But at the point of being hired because we're not eligible for clearances, uh, we, 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 cannot, we cannot be considered for the job. So that's, that's, a, that's a major challenge. I was lucky enough to find a company in the private sector that actually recognized and acknowledged the leadership experience that they had uh, in the military. And so I, I ended up having a job here. But the, the struggle for a lot of military spouses, foreign-born military spouses, is again to, to find a way to transfer their credentials and their, their education and the professional certification here in the U.S. and contribute to, as Angela was saying, to the support the, the, mili the family, the military family. That's, that's the main struggle. All right, well, thank you, Marco. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. So I think one of the things that uh, we talk about continuing the conversation is that oftentimes uh, we've, I've had these conversations with military spouses around the country. If you look at the uh, ranking member mentioned about national security, the impact it has on national security, when our military spouses are not employed or their ability to retain that employment when uh, some their service members call the active duty of their guard reserve or they deploy. But oftentimes, uh, conversations I've had personally with some of the spouses is that their spouses who are serving on active duty are choosing to leave the military service so their spouses can actually now have a career. I spoke with a chief warrant officer actually out of J Bo Joint Base Lewis McCord. He had been in the military for 22 years. His wife had changed numerous careers and hadn't had a a complete career trajectory, and so he was getting ready to retire out of the military, even though he wasn't ready to retire. And so, Faye, I know you mentioned about your military service, so thank you for that. But talk about your experience when you transitioned it out and, and also the impact on your, your spouse. Sure, thank you. Um, yes, I transitioned out quite a while ago, over 10 years ago, and there, what, there weren't the same types of programs that there are now. So um, it's really encouraging to see um, how DOD and DOL and VA and all the agencies have really um, made transition and, and starting to make military spouses and the whole family more of a priority, um, you know, over the, over the past 10, 15 years as I've been involved with the military. Um, but yes, we, uh, my husband was a active duty Air Force pilot for 14 years, obviously really high tempo, uh, lots of deployments, lots of missions over, so he has thousands of combat hours. I, I don't even know the, the statistics, but, um, uh, yeah, and he, he loved it, but over those 
10 years. Um, I, we, when we got married, I was in law school. And um, so, you know, the deployments, lifestyle was fine. I was busy, he was busy. Um, but when I graduated, I wanted to work and it really wasn't feasible for me to do so at all. Um, we, you know, when you're moving every three or four years, it, you know, you have to find out what state you're going to. You have to study for the bar, take the bar, probably takes a year, year and a half. Um, and then you're in a place with no network, so you're trying to network, and then maybe you have two years left to work, so it's just not, uh, it wasn't possible for me. I, um, I did volunteer work, I, I had a couple of jobs that were sort of on a stipend type of work, um, but really never had a job with a regular income, um, and ended up taking, I think, four different bar exams <laughs> over the years, past three of them, <laughs> um, and yeah, didn't result in really any money. Um, I was one of the lucky ones. Um, I was in the Air Force. The Air Force paid for my undergrad and my schooling, so I wasn't in a huge amount of debt. Um, so luckily, it wasn't a huge financial strain on our family, but it really was a strain as far as um, really kind of mental health, honestly. I mean, I'm just a person that really needs to work. I was a stay-at-home mom for 10 years, and um, it really was not good for my mental health, <laughs> I'll just say that, and, and my, um, my ambition and, and really need and, and wanting to work. So, um, you know, and my husband experienced that with me. I think it, it definitely affects the service member. You know, I think sometimes still um, the services consider um, military spouse employment to kind of be a, a nice to have thing. Like if we can support you, then we'll do it, but it's not really a pr our priority. You know, the mission of the, of the military is the priority, but they, I think, it, people are starting to recognize that that mission really is affected. Um, my husband um, was doing missions, training missions, combat missions, while I was at home with a baby. He was waking up three times a night and then going to fly, <laughs> um, you know, at six in the morning. Um, and so it really was a strain, I think, on both of us. Um, and so after he, he did a staff tour, um, and he was home every day, and by that point we had two kids, and. Um, and I, I really wanted to work, and I said, you can't go back to flying. Like, it's not a lifestyle that, that we can go back to with these two little kids. And so he got out. And um, after 14 years, was willing to give up that military retirement, um, which was a lot. I think that was the big thing, willing to give up flying um, just, cause, just because it wasn't a sustainable lifestyle. So I really think um, the DOD especially has to recognize that they will be losing people. I think, you know, you talked about the numbers and the recruiting numbers, that it's not a sustainable lifestyle a lot of times for, for folks. So um, luckily he managed to get a job um, that he really loves with the Maryland Air National Guard. Um, kind of wish we knew, not to, not to be a guard recruiter, but kind of wish we knew about those options before. But yeah, it really does, that military spouse employment really does affect um, the bottom line for the military, and I'm glad that, that there's starting to be some recognition of that. For sharing that and one thing i'll add that she took the bar four times so she passed four times so if anybody needs an attorney you know you definitely want to go to somebody who's taking the bar four times right i like my job now so <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna keep it for now thank so, you though but uh but i think that story resonates with a lot of people right here in the room again story with people uh watching the video because spouses as i told you are choosing careers to support their spouse who has not had an opportunity to have a career because of transitioning from the military, deployments, things like that. One thing that you did mention was mental health. I think that's often lost on a lot of people and how your mental health is affected as the person looking for employment, but also how that resonates across your entire family when they're going through this together, right? The transition is, affects everybody. And so I think that's something that's really important. We have to highlight the impact that mental health has on the individual looking for employment, especially when they're not having a sustainable career, right? Uh, one of the things also that is often left out of the equation is that we do have uh, family members in the military on active duty that actually have uh, exceptional family members within their family unit, right? I mean, children, the spouses themselves sometimes, and oftentimes they have to take care of them. And I'll tell you, as someone who's deployed, it's easier being deployed than it is being the family staying back because they're the ones that have to deal with everything. When you're, you have a job to do while you're deployed, the families, everything goes wrong, right? We know that, especially if you have an exceptional family member. So, uh, Megan, talk a little bit about that. I know you uh, are uh, somebody who works within the Exceptional Family Member Program. You, that affects you personally. So let everybody know a little bit about how that impacts you and your ability to maintain solid employment 
or career, uh, a career is itself. Yeah. So I am in the Exceptional Family Members Program. Um, I actually just got enrolled about a year ago. Um, and part of that came from, we've been really lucky that we have, we've only been for five years and we haven't been nearly as many places as some of these people have been. Um, but we did, my husband was stationed at um, Fort Myer in the Honor Guard for a while. And he decided to change his MOS to counterintelligence. So he had to go to training in Arizona. Um, we, at the time, didn't know where we would be going. We heard Korea. Um, but being a part of this program, um, I was not able to go with him because it was less than a year. And so I had to, for my own mental health, because once again, just like Faye said, it's very hard. I have treatment-resistant depression as well as anxiety. Sorry. <laughs> but so I had to move um, back to Ohio because that's where my support system is. And then, um, so then we got stationed back here, and, um, but of course I had a, I lost my job because of that, um, and so that was difficult. Um, sorry. And I'm, like Faye said, I like to work. I don't want to be, I don't want to stay at home. I think about my career. Um, I'm currently a teacher. So luckily, teaching positions are just about everywhere, which is nice. Um, but it is still very different going to different schools. It's like a completely different culture. Uh, so actually, I'm making the transition to get out of teaching into um, a remote job because that does give us the opportunity for our career growth and you know, hearing from people who've been in the been a military spouse for a while has kind of opened up my eyes and made me more forward thinking and what is best for me and my, our family. Um, and I think the biggest two thing that I want to add on being a newer military spouse is just knowing that there are all these programs, that there's all this support, because I think that's the hardest thing for me is really in the past year is when I've started to learn more about it, and it's been five years. So I think that is a big thing to touch on too, because we are I am very appreci appreciative of all the things there are, but just knowing what things there are, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you. In five years in the military it can be an eternity sometimes, right? So, uh, but thanks for being vulnerable for us. And uh, thank you for sharing that. I know it's tough uh, when you talk about, you know, how impactful this is on you individually and your family. Uh, but again, I think these are things that is constantly happening across our entire country for our men and women who serve, right? And on top of that, uh, the families who are impacted by that service as well. We know it's important to them because that's why they do it, right? So with that, what are some of the things, and in, in, we can go to start with Angela, with you. What are some of the things you think would have been helpful for you, right, as you're looking to make that transition uh, empl through employment, regardless if it's your first time looking for a job, regardless if you've been doing this for a while, uh, what are some of the things that would have been helpful for you, right, to make sure that you could take that break, right, from a job, right, while you have it because of an exceptional family member, uh, thing that you have to take care of, or uh, now if someone's deployed, things like that. What are some of the things, in your opinion, could have been helpful for you to help maintain your career trajectory and set you up for long-term success? It, however you want to explain it. So we'll start with you. Okay. Well, so I think that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there, so what's great about, and what I love about the military community, and they touched on this earlier, is it's a bipartisan effort. And so we have a lot of great resources available for the military community. I feel like we have a lot of educational opportunities, and so, but what's happening is a lot of the military spouses are, their education and experience levels don't coincide, and so it makes it difficult to gain employment. So I think there's a 
huge education piece for employers to look at volunteer experience or look at these non-traditional experience pieces and see how that's going to translate and create an opportunity for military spouses in their workforce. Um, in addition, I, you know, whenever we first started, when you first start as a military spouse in the community, it's a little bit easier because you may be newer yourself in the workforce. And so the jobs you're seeking are a little bit easier to obtain. But as you move on and your resume starts to show this very transient lifestyle and you start to try to move up in your career, those jobs are, 80% of those jobs are found through networking. And it's impossible for military spouses to have a network in every location. And so that's where that employer education really, really would take effect. Um, some things people don't think about with military spouse lifestyle is we don't, when you're changing jobs so frequently or you're having to move stations, you don't have the time to get the benefits that the civilian employees may have, like vacation, and we mentioned the retirement. Um, we had a baby, and my husband was quickly deployed after having her, and I had to go back to work in six weeks, and so that can be very challenging. And if you're career-minded, if you take that break, you're always thinking, how am I going to position myself for the next station if I take a break and I have this gap in employment? And so that's where I think if we can educate employers and help them understand that this is, I mean, 21% as an unemployment rate, if that's any population, we're really going to take a look at that. And military spouses are no different. We're a civilian population. We want to work, sometimes need to work or have to work. And so there's really no reason that we can't treat this population with the same respect and dignity as we would any other population. Thank you, Angela. And I think that's often lost on folks, right? Is they don't understand the impact that military spouse service has with the overall success of someone's service, whether it's four years, 20 years, 30 years, right? The military spouse community is indeed part of that service and the entire family. So when someone transitions out of the military, it's not only the service member, it's the spouse, it's the children also, right? And so it is impactful. It's an impactful transition for all of them, right? Especially when you're looking to change careers, as you mentioned. So, Marco? Yeah, thank you. Uh, one of the things that I also wanted to um, kind of discuss and think through, uh, the value the value of military spouses, the way I see military spouses is really like the backbone of military families. Uh, so we support, uh, we encourage, we motivate. And um, one of the challenge, again, for foreign-born military spouses, and I think actually the value of foreign-born military spouses that we can bring at the table in this great community. And again, I'm, I'm with you. I'm very appreciative of all the support because this is pretty unique. I was in the military myself, so I have knowledge of the military world. <laughs> Uh, this is pretty unique to, to the United States. There's not such support in, from and in any army in the world from the military families. So I'm very appreciative of, of, of all the possibilities and, and the support uh, and the attention to military spouses. The value, I think, of that niche of foreign-born military spouses, thinking of, of the United States and the strategic uh, uh, position that the United States has in the world, we can really bring strategic advantage and competitive advantage compared to other nations. We, we can bring to the table naturally like a language skill set, cultural awareness, something that it's really invaluable. And for the government especially, the fact that the US is so projected in the world, uh, that is something that we, we have in-house for free. We don't need to build that skill set. We don't need to build that knowledge. We don't need to train people on cultural awareness, we have we have that value. We have the we have the plus that we should we should we should be able to leverage on because that this is a way also for military spouses to pay back the the challenges to move to adapt to another country is there. That would be a great way for us for foreign-born military spouses have an opportunity to pay back and to be to be supportive in a way that it's also not just meaningful for our military family, but also for the greater uh, organization like the military or the federal uh, government. So that is something that I think really foreign born military spouses can bring at the table. It's a value added uh, that 
that could be could be considered uh, at some point. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, I've had conversations with foreign board spouses at Fort Hood in Texas and Alaska, right? And and they all said the same thing that you just said. Every one of them want to work. They're highly skilled, highly educated, but yet there are barriers for that employment. And so I think we're doing a disservice by not trying to find ways to get them uh, meaningfully employed. So thanks for sharing your story with that. Okay. Yes, in my experience, I think there are a lot of programs out there for military spouses, including some of the ones that you, you talked about earlier. Um, and really appreciative of that. Um, I, I think it's great. I think the, the issue is kind of um, twofold is one, finding out about them because there just seems to be, when, when I was looking for jobs, there seemed to be a lot of different programs and things for military spouses, but it was hard to, you'd really have to search them out. And, and even when you were looking, you wouldn't necessarily find all of them. I didn't know about DOL vets until I started working here in DC. So, um, so I think the challenge is, is getting the, that information about the programs that are available um, out to spouses. Um, and I, I think also as far as the flexibilities that the service members have as well, I think DOD has made a lot of um, progress in, in those, um, you know, opportunities for the guard, for the reserve, um, opportunities to take a break in service if you need to. So I think um, it would be great to kind of project the options to the service members as well. Um, and I think the other challenge is kind of what Angela said as well, is matching the military spouse's skills to what's out there. Um, when I used to go to job fairs and, and be a part of these programs, you'd see a lot of sort of technical skills or it would sort of be like either entry level, like come work at Home Depot or Starbucks, or it would be, um, you know, come work as a project manager at Boeing, um, neither of which I as a lawyer <laughs> could do. And so uh, I think people really didn't know what to do with professional military spouses. And I have friends who are CPAs, um, architects, um, all kind, you know, obviously other lawyers, doctors, um, who have really necessary skills, um, but in the space of three or four years, don't, aren't, aren't able to find a job or it isn't worth their time. They can't get paid enough to cover the childcare and to cover maybe a spouse who's deploying a lot and it's just not, not worth it for them. So I think those are the main challenges um, that I saw when I was looking for jobs. Thanks for sharing that. One of the conversations we constantly have with um, corporate leaders is oftentimes right, the old adage that we don't want to hire a military spouse because they're going to leave every couple years. Well, that narrative has changed because the younger generation are not staying in their jobs either that long. They're looking for what's next in their careers also. And so we have to look for ways to be innovative to help protect those military spouses and find ways to keep them employed because it's a lot less expensive for uh, companies to retain someone than it is to hire someone, right? And so if they are being able to retain in their current job is good for companies, and we want to remind them of that. So part of one of the things we do at Department of Labor Vets is educate and inform people all around the country. All of our state directors, our regional veteran employment coordinators at all six regions, all of our team across the country is, is spending a lot of time doing exactly that. And we'll actually have a QR code up here for everybody that's online to, to scan that QR code and see all the resources that we do have as well. So Megan, over to you. So yeah, same thing, um, like Faye said, um, big thing, um, just knowing what's out there, I think, especially um, as a newer military spouse when you first come, come in, knowing the different things that are out there. Um, also, um, with like the different programs that VETS offers is great, um, and just knowing about them. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the main thing, I think, for me. So, we, so thanks. So we do have a lot of spouses who are, who are teachers, but they, they shift, right? And they get the licensing credentials. That's been a big thing that, uh, as the ranking member mentioned, as uh, Congressman uh, Van Orden, the chairman's mentioned before, things that they want to do to improve uh, the ability to transfer uh, licenses, uh, credentials, things like that. So we're, there's a lot of work being done there. But uh, as a teacher in itself, what experience did you have when you had, you mentioned a little bit about having to take a break, right? But being able to uh, have your job there, if you had to take that break, how impactful would that have been for you? So I think it would be impactful. I think the um, 
the biggest thing too with me is um, not knowing, because my, my school district does have some things in place on their own, which is great, but not all school districts have that. But at the time, I didn't know we would come back to this area. I did not think we would at all. Um, so not knowing that, and because typically that's how it is in the military. It's very, you know, last minute, oh, you're going here now. <laughs> um, but having the, something in place to where you would have a job when you came back would be super beneficial, I think, for any military spouse. Thank you. So with a little bit of time we have left, uh, what, we, what I'd like to do is just give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about, for people in the audience, people that's uh, watching uh, via video, what would you have liked to, to tell them about what we can do to really support our military spouse community with regards to employment, right? Sustainability of that employment, helping us, you know, protect our military spouses so that way they can take a break when they have to and not have fear of losing that job because they have to take care of family or their spouse is deployed, things like that. What is something that you would, uh, that you haven't had a chance to tell people who really don't, don't understand, what would you like to convey to someone? So. So I'll, I'll make it pretty simple, but if somebody is applying for a job and they're filling out an application, ask if they're a military spouse because so often military spouses feel like they have to hide that they're a military spouse until, and I did that until the point that I'd moved around so much and moved to Japan that it was kind of always around military installations that I couldn't hide it anymore. And if we had employers that were asking up front, then it would help to answer some of those questions about why is this person moving around and understanding that they're actually supporting their service member serving the country as opposed to somebody moving around, which there's no no problem either way, but I think it's really, I, I think, you know, when you're a military spouse and your spouse is serving the country, the pay is sometimes different than the civilian population that is moving around by choice. And so um, I would say ask on applications if somebody is a military spouse and really consider those people and look a little bit deeper at their resumes and the skills that they're bringing to the table and the experience. We've had so much cultural experience and then also just quickly building programs are very resilient. And I feel like those are kind of unique traits that military spouses are able to bring to a workplace and something that can help to kind of transform and be positive impact on, on the workplace. So that's what I would ask is ask people if they're a military spouse and take that information and consider them for employment. Yes, um, I just want to follow up on what just Angela said and what I mentioned before. It's really about awareness. Uh, awareness on, from, from both sides, it's mutual, uh, from corporate uh, environment and from us. So being aware of what's out there and from, from employers being aware that we are a resource, an asset they can leverage on because of, uh, again, the value that, that, that we can bring at the table. Uh, foreign born military spouses, the, the unemployment rate is almost double uh, than, than normal military spouses, I would say. Uh, so really, it's, it's about awareness. It's about sending a message out there and advocate for, for what we can bring at the table and, and from, from employer's perspective, being aware that we are there. Uh, we, we, we are more than, than happy to leverage on, on what, we can, what we can bring at the table, what we can, we can offer. And ultimately, again, it's, it's about awareness. So talking about this, it's... It's just amazing as, as it is in itself, uh, but keep keep sending out the message and keep motivating military spouses to advocate for themselves and provide that awareness and that knowledge to corporate environment, government, that we are here <laughs> and we really want to continue to support our family and broadly, more broadly, uh, the country. Great, thank you, Marco. Faye? I would just, I think, reemphasize what I said earlier that military spouse employment really is a, a national security um, priority. Uh, if if spouses aren't happy, their service members are not going to be happy. Um, you know, it's it's not the 1950s anymore. I don't think you can expect folks to move around every three or four years and and last 
for 20, 30 years in the military. Um, so I think just, you know, I think we're getting there. I think there's a lot of programs being put in place, um, you know, but we're not quite there yet. I think um, there's a lot that can still be done to prioritize military spouses, especially um, it, considering that employment really affects every part of a family's life. You know, it affects the fi their finances, it, it affects mental health. Um, and so we really, just looking at the numbers, you know, from DOD, we really can't afford to to not prioritize this issue, um, or I think you will continue to see problems recruiting and retaining um, service members. So really, just recognizing, I think, and it happens. It needs to happen at all levels, right? I think it needs to happen from the very top of the Pentagon and government agencies all the way down to individual commanders who who need to recognize, you know, that that service members hopefully will prioritize their family as much as possible. Um, and so just continuing, I think we're moving in the right direction and, and you know, with, with help from you and, and um, your team, and I, I think we can get there. I think we're going in the right direction. Great, thank you. Megan. So I think just knowing the value of military spouses is the most important. Um, I know in past jobs like Angela, I've tried not to bring up that I'm a military spouse because when I do, it's typically, well, how long are you going to be here? <laughs> and I think um, with that being said, like you said, you know, young people are tending to move from job to job anyways. And I think we have a very unique skill set as military spouses, having the resili resiliency, the adaptability, um, things like that, that we can offer to any employer. And I think there are a lot of employers out there that are making strides towards seeing that. And I've recognized and became aware of some, um, but it needs to continue going that way, and hopefully it does. Well, thank you guys for, for sharing that. I'll tell you, I'd be remiss if I didn't say personally, you know, 21 years in the Marines, 17 of those I was married, and my wife moved every three years, every four years, and of course through deployments, raising children also. So she was impacted, so I know firsthand how this impacts a family community and our staff. 90 plus percent of our staff at VETS are veterans themselves. Many of them serve over 20 plus years. The other staff that are not uh, veterans are completely passionate about what we do as an organization all across our entire agency. So er this resonates with everybody, not only within DOL VETS, up on the hill, across all of our federal partners, uh, they understand that we have something here that we have to do, right? And so we're looking for ways to continue to strengthen our support for military spouses. And as I mentioned, it's part of our vision statement. So we wholeheartedly believe in, the, in what we have to do to continue to support our military spouses. And I can't thank you guys enough for coming up and sharing your stories. Uh, this is hopefully uh, resonates with everybody in the room, but of course on uh, video as well, because these are real life stories and they impact our military community every single day. This happens all across our entire military uh, to include overseas, and we want to make sure that uh, we continue to tell your story. So thank you all for, for coming up, spending some time with us, and uh, let's give them a round of applause, everyone, please. Awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories today. And to reiterate, um, sometimes it's just finding those resources. So if you can just set foot, tell military spouses, any of those that are watching online, set foot on your TAP installation, go on installation, set foot into your TAP office. As uh, the Assistant Secretary mentioned, we have our empl Employment Navigator uh, pilot program that can assist you with some wraparound services. Um, please set foot into your AJCs. If you take anything from the conversation today, go there and they will help you try to um, do some of those upskilling, reskilling, workforce development tools, items. Um, for the next portion, I want to introduce Paul. Um, he is our senior compliance policy advisor uh, who will be speaking on our fiscal year 24 budget priority initiatives to discuss military spouse employment protections. Paul has been the agency's senior compliance policy advisor since 2019. He is a retired colonel and served over 24 years in the U.S. Army Reserve Judge Advocate. Thanks, Chief. Uh, and thanks again to our terrific panel. I mean, that was a fabulous opportunity to hear your stories. And thank you for your generosity in sharing your stories. And I know 
today we also have a lot of other military spouses. I know one in particular has joined us today, but I know out there we have other military spouses. So I would like us to uh, give another round of applause, not only to our panel, but to all our military spouses joining us here today. So as, as, as our chief mentioned, my name is Paul Marone. I'm a recovering attorney as well. I, I, uh, I think I have a uh, Faye beat. I, I took uh, five bar exams in four states. Uh, uh, note to self, you just can't wing the bar exam. You actually have to prepare for it. So uh, I, feel, I feel Faye's pain. Uh, but I'm here to, to talk to you all about the department's priorities for military spouses in the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, and I have my uh, colleague in the back who's helping me uh, with the slide. So Chris, if you could just hit the next slide. So we recognize the problem that our military spouses have in the employment arena. And, um, and these barriers are not just simply to the individual military families. Of course, the military family feels that impact, but um, it has a broader a broader uh, a sense. It, it has a broader problem for our, for our nation. Um, so first I want to talk about the impact on, and I can't even rival the, the panels talking about the financial impact on the family, but the days of the single family, the single income family are over. That is not an option anymore. Today, dual income families are, are necessary, and, and our military families have that over and above are our civilian families. And so we should recognize that. And so we need to find ways to ensure that military spouses can have meaningful employment. And they face so many challenges, and we heard all about them. I'm going to talk, I'm going to highlight a few of them in a minute. But the other issue that we had, and we heard about this from the panel as well, is the impact on national security. Uh, military spouses impact our ability to recruit, retain, and make our forces ready. Because many of these decisions are not made at the, uh, at the unit, at the unit uh, room. They're made at the kitchen table, right? And so the decisions to stay in the military are made at the kitchen table. Whether to join in the first place could be made at the kitchen table. It's very important that we recognize that. And our all-volunteer force depends on the support of military spouses. And I'm going to take it one step further. They don't just support our nation and our service members. They serve. They serve, and their service should be recognized, and it should be protected. So we think there is a part of the solution that we can help with. And we think that the Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act provides protections that can be extended to military spouses. And we think we have a part of the solution. It's not the whole solution, it's at least part of the solution. And we think that by extending those protections, which I'll talk about in a little more detail, the extent of those protections, one of which, very important, reemployment protections. And I know we talked about that, we heard about that from the panel, about how important that would be for military spouses to have that protection. But we think USERRA provides a vehicle for that and, and the department is prepared uh, to take steps to try to make that happen. Chris, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so you heard much better, you heard about uh, the challenges that military spouses face much better from the panel than you could hear from me, but I just wanna highlight a few. We heard about discrimination, right? Folks that would uh, find out that a military spouse uh, you know, could be moving in a couple of years. So maybe a reluctance to hire that person in the first place, so they face discrimination. Um, we heard about the loss of job benefits and the ability, the, the lack of ability to vest retirement benefits, right? Because they're moving around so frequently, they can't establish long-term employment with the same employer. And so uh, just the nature of military service, um, Military spouses in, in serving with their service member suffer from these frequent moves, having to restart careers. For our professional military spouses, they suffer from lack of license portability. Now we've made tremendous strides there, but it's not complete. There is still some gaps in our ability to um, 
transfer licensing and credentials across state lines. And so I know from my colleagues when I served in the JAG Corps, um, and, my, and at the time my um, purple, people I served with, their spouses were attorneys. And so now they're moving from state to state and some don't have reciprocity. And, and we're, uh, we're making strides in that direction, but it's not complete. So it is a challenge. And then we also heard this from the panel members, gaps in resumes, right? Because they move so frequently that they now have to explain all these gaps. They cannot establish long-term employment for career progression, for retirement vesting benefits, um, for professional growth. So these are all challenges our, our military spouses face. Chris, next slide, please. On top of all the financial issues, right, we have a national security issue because we rely on an all-volunteer force to protect the nation. And folks, you know, we, we, when USERRA was enacted in 1994, it was enacted with the idea that service members who choose to serve should not be penalized in their civilian employment for that service. What is the military spouse doing? The military spouse is serving together with the uniformed service member. They are putting their career often on hold to be able to do that. And, you know, some, some service members may say, you know what, this is too much of a burden on my spouse. I'm not going to even go in. I'm, I'm going to choose another career path. So now we're losing qualified candidates in a time when we really can't afford to lose qualified candidates in our recruitment. We're losing qualified folks in retention becomes too hard to stay in. So they make decisions based on their family need. Perhaps now is the time for me to leave military service because my spouse has not been able to establish their own career and now it's time for us as a family to support another career. And so maybe qualified people are now leaving service because of the family need. And so now we're losing uh, service members that we, we need to retain because they're making decisions at the kitchen table to leave. And then also readiness. And we talked a little bit about this from the, in the panel, but if a service member has financial pressure um, because their, their spouse is not, is not working and they, they, ex and they have stress at home, that impacts their readiness to serve as a, as a service member. And so what we want to do is to try to alleviate that stress and we think we can do that by helping to improve military spouse employment outcomes. So military spouses serve and they support the all volunteer force in recruitment, retention, and readiness. Chris, next slide, please. So what is USERRA? We heard this acronym before, the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. It's been on the books since 1994, but the protections date back to after World War II. They have under different names, but the, these protections have existed before for service members. They, per, they uh, prohibit employers from discriminating against uh, service members. They protect against retaliation. Um, and, most, uh, and what USERRA is mostly known for are the reemployment protections. And that uh, ensures that service members upon completion of military service, they satisfy the prerequisites to reemployment. I'll talk a little bit about that. They are entitled to reemployment. And they uh, seek reemployment and are re to be reemployed with their employer as if they never left. And that's key, right? Because with frequent breaks or interruptions, folks could suffer in their career, in their employment. And so what USERRA does is it puts you back to where you would have been had you never left. And we think that's key. Uh, in, in terms of when we, when we talk about absences for uniformed service members, but also we talk about absences that are, that are sustained by our military spouses. Now, what we are, what we, uh, are proposing is that uh, USARA provides a vehicle that we think can provide part of the solution and that it can be amended. And what we're proposing is not uh, outrageous in, by any stretch. You, Congress has amended USERRA many times over the last 20 plus years to, in, to extend employment and reemployment protections, and they've done so to both the other types of military members, but they've also done so for civilian members who perform a non-military type service. And so just highlighted a few of them on the slide. 
the uh, National Disaster Medical System. It's a non-uniform service, civilian service. They have USERRA protections. The uh, Urban Search and Rescue, another civilian organization, non-military with protection. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration had to look this up. They are a uniform service, but uh, they are mostly a civilian uniform service that uh, has protections. We recently had two changes extending uh, protections to National Guard for state active duty. That's a change. It was limited to federal duty before. It's a recent change. And then most recently, FEMA reservists, Federal Emergency Management Agency reservists, civilians called up for disaster relief. They now have USERRA protection. So changing USERRA, it's not an outrageous proposition. It's been done many times over the last 20 years. Slide, please, Chris. Okay, so talk about the statute. Who is protected by USERRA? So right now, it's service in the uniform services. And it doesn't matter if it's voluntary or involuntary. If, if the service is for, is based upon that service, it is covered under the statute. Um, all different types of service are covered. It doesn't have to be limited to active duty service. It could be um, active duty for training. Uh, it could be you know, what we used to call drill weekends, which is now called inactive duty training. Uh, could be for funeral details. I know a lot of our Guard and National Reserve are called upon uh, to perform a service in support of funeral details. It applies to our reserve component, so National Guard and Reserve, but also to our active component. And that's, and that's key because if we're looking to extend it to military spouses, we're not just talking about reserve and National Guard spouses. We're talking about active duty spouses as well. Um, and here's a couple of other, uh, on the slide, a couple of other organizations that have uh, USARA protections. Uh, the Commission Corps, the Public Health Service, again, a uniform service. Um, another, another organization with USARA protections. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk briefly about what USARA protects, right? It's, it is, uh, the, the, the big one is it protects against discrimination. And so employers may not discriminate or take adverse action against a protected person uh, based on their status as a member of the uniform service, so their, their protected status. Um, and this counts both in initial hiring, promotions, retention and employment, all the different types of employment um, activities. It is not just limited to current service, so you have protections against discrimination even if you are no longer currently serving. Um, you even have protections if you're not even in the military yet. If you're, if you're a recruit, uh, and, and then you could be discriminated against because, uh, if you're discriminated against because you are thinking about joining the military and, and taking steps to do that, and then you are discriminated against, say you're fired because of that, you're protected under USERRA as well. And now the statute also recognizes hostile work environment claims. So what it does is it prevents hostile work environment based on the protected status as a uniform service member. So uh, USERRA is the federal statute that, talk, that, that, that protects against discrimination for service, uh, for, for uniform service. It's not under Title VII. It's not under the ADA. It's under USERRA. So USERRA is a very powerful law designed to protect uh, persons based on uniform service. Next slide, please. The cousin of discrimination is retaliation. And so USERRA also protects against, uh, protects against retaliation. Uh, employers cannot retaliate against service members um, or take any adverse action based on their protected activity. So their protected activity could be filing a claim because they think their rights have been violated. Um, it also extends to non-military persons that happen to participate in an investigation for one of their coworkers in, uh, in a USARA, protecting their rights under USARA. So for instance, if a coworker talks to a VETS investigator about a, a USARA claim that the service member filed in the, to, a, to try to uh, uh, um, address a violation of their rights under USERRA, that non-military affiliated coworker who speaks on that service member's behalf, if they suffer an adverse action, they're protected under USERRA as well under the anti-retaliation provisions. Uh, and so, uh, so now we have reach, we have USERRA's reach beyond the uniform services into some non-military affiliated people who are supporting service members uh, in, in their uh, USERRA rights.
Next slide, please. And so reemployment is the probably the one that USARA is mostly known for. Uh, and this is the protection to ensure that when service members leave civilian employment, they are entitled to reemployment upon their return if they satisfy what we call certain prerequisites to employment, to reemployment. So they have to leave the job to, for the purpose of serving in the uniformed services. They have to provide advance notice, although we encourage that at advance notice be in writing. It's not a requirement under the statute. It could be either writing or verbal. Uh, the service cannot exceed five years. Uh, so we call that a cumulative service limit. Those five years, though, um, are subject to a number of exemptions that exclude certain types of service from that five-year cumulative service limit. And after 9-11, um, we saw a lot of we saw a lot of service exempted based upon uh, the national emergency um, that uh, the, the nation faced. So uh, even though the five-year cumulative service limit is in place, oftentimes service can exceed that because it's a, there's an exempted service. Uh, one of the key conditions for uh, eligibility under USARA is to not have a disqualifying discharge. And that is limited by the statute. It's not every type of, um, every type of discharge that is not an honorable discharge. It's limited to the really bad discharges, the dis dishonorable discharge, the bad conduct discharge, the other than honorable discharge. Uh, and that's a term of art, other than honorable. That does not mean anything that is not an honorable. Those types of uh, discharges can be dis are disqualifying under USERRA. Dismissals for officers is also disqualifying. Being dropped from the rolls is disqualifying. But there are a lot of other types of discharges that are not disqualifying under USERRA. For instance, an uncharacterized discharge is not disqualifying. So we get a lot of questions about that. We have a great fact sheet on our website to describe all the different types of discharges that are out there and the ones that are disqualifying because it's very limited. But there is a confusion there, both in the um, service member community and in the employer community. So we always try to s resolve those questions uh, through use of fact sheets on our website. Uh, and then the final uh, prerequisite to reemployment is the uh, have to give notice of the return or prompt return to employment. So uh, the, the significance of the reemployment re protections under USERRA is that if a service member meets these five requirements, they're entitled to reemployment. And then the question becomes is what position should they be reemployed in? And remember, we talked about uh, being reemployed in a position as if they never left. Chris, can you hit the next slide, please? And so what we refer to uh, that position is called the escalator principle, the escalator position. It's based on uh, a case, a Supreme Court case uh, from back in the day, in the, in the 1940s, where um, uh, it was Fishgold versus Sullivan Dry Dock. And the judge in that case described the situation that when an employee leaves for service and they return, they don't return to the position that they left they return to a position that they would have been in had they never left. In other words, the position was kind of on, a, on an escalator, and, and, and you, you, jump, you jump off the escalator for service, but then you jump back on where you would have been had you never left. Um, and, that, and that counts for all different types of uh, benefits that go along with employment, seniority status, uh, pay, any type of uh, promotions, wage increases, uh, pension benefits. Uh, those all come back to the service member, the returning service member, as if they had never left. Now, uh, when you think about an escalator, what's the significance? Sometimes you have an up escalator and sometimes you have a down escalator, right? So sometimes uh, the escalator may not have moved forward for that service member in their absence. Sometimes it moves backwards. And so that's just, uh, um, that's just the nature of, uh, of the employment because uh, USARA protects the person in the position they would have been in had they never left. It's possible that the employer may have downsized, may have had layoffs, and if the person had been there, they would have been subject to that. So the concept of the escalator pr principle is both positive and potentially negative. We use a reasonably certain standard to decide, to determine what the position would have been in. So our investigators are trained in doing the analysis to ensure that uh, we could see what would have been reasonably certain uh, as far as the position and the benefits that service members would have received. And there, um, if there is a uh, term position, so a temporary position that had no 
uh, reasonable certainty of continuation. Uh, the fact that somebody left to do military service doesn't toll that time, doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't um, put that on hold for their absence. So it's just another concept. Next slide, please. So um, I've explained a little bit about what USERRA is and, and what it protects and who it protects. Um, but now I want to explain why we think USERRA can be part of the solution. So uh, as you know, USERRA has been in effect since 1994. It's, a, it's predecessor statutes have been in effect dating way back to the 1940s. So it provides a statutory and a regulatory platform for anti-discrimination, anti-retaliation, and re-employment protections that is based on status in the service in the uniform services and status based on that service. And um, as we look at all the different potential solutions to uh, military spouse unemployment, we think USERRA can be one potential vehicle to extend employment and reemployment protections. And as we've seen, USERRA has been amended many times over the last 20 years. It can be amended again to protect military spouses for their own absences, right? It's no longer talking about the, the absence of the service member, which is already protected. Now we're talking about protecting the military spouse absence based on their service member's service. And uh, we think this is vital uh, to uh, ensuring the continuation, the recruitment, retention, and support of the all-volunteer force. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is like the punchline. You know, like when's, when's Paul going to get to the punchline? The punchline is in uh, department uh, congressional budget justification, VETS has placed military spouse um, protections at the top of the list. And so right now, in, in VETS major initiatives for FY 2024, we support the administration's priorities of equity and serving underserved populations and ensuring that military spouse employment rights are protected. And so um, what the department is supporting is, is, and through its congressional budget justification, is asking that USERRA protections be extended to protect military spouses. And we think this can be done through changes in legislation, and we've uh, requested uh, funding to support this initiative to extend these protections to military spouses. And we believe it aligns with the president's unity agenda and the administration's emphasis on improving economic security of military and veteran families. Um, the president and the first lady have been very supportive of this endeavor. You can see that in the messages that the President and the First Lady have put out in support of military families. Um, so I don't think, I think we, I think we and, and today you heard from our distinguished guests how important this issue is uh, for our leadership. So with that, uh, I want to thank my colleague in the back, Christopher Evans, for his help during this presentation. I'd like to thank my wife, Marjorie Cavello, who's here and a military spouse herself for her support throughout this. So this is the end of my presentation, but only the beginning of our conversation. Um, and so now I'd like to open up our question and answer session for those attending in person today. Uh, and, those, and for those of you that are virtual, we have that QR code posted, which you can use to contact us with your questions. We'll have to get back to you with the answers. But at this time, I re respectfully ask our Assistant Secretary, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, our Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy, uh, Julian Purdy, to join me on stage to field your questions. And I'll ask the Chief of Staff, uh, Carla Langham, to join us at the podium to facilitate our question and answer session. And um, if you will be bear with us a moment, uh, because we are projecting this to our virtual audience, if you're going to ask a question, please wait for one of our colleagues to bring the microphone to you so that, we could, so that your question could be heard. So with that, I'll ask you to join me here.
Um, it looks like Mr. Denton has a question, so please. I, I do, and this is a softball, uh, but we had a teacher up here. So, Paul, the question I have, if I'm an active duty spouse and my worst half goes to a six-month school and I'm a school teacher, it's a two-part question. Number one, what are my rights right now as far as I want to take a knee while my worst half is at school and take care of my family? What rights do I have now? And then what would be the difference if you, Sarah, were to be extended? So sorry to pick on teachers, but my, my wife was a teacher as well. So. So first, I have to say, this is not a planted question. Uh, this is our director of national programs, Ivan Denton, who's raising the question uh, based on his own lived experience, because this is a very uh, real experience for our service members, especially those that have military spouses who work uh, in the education area. Uh, and so right now, the, that, that educator is limited to the protections they may have through their, uh, as, as we heard during the panel, really limited to what that school district provides. There is no, uh, there, there may be some protections under FIMLA if it's somehow related to some of the healthcare issues. But other than that right now, uh, they'd be beholden to their school district for protections. So um, as, as uh, Director Denton experienced, you know, uh, the district may be initially supportive of that, but then say, hey, you know, we got a school to run. You, 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 have, to come, you have to come back to work. Uh, USARA would provide for uh, an absence, an authorized absence from that employment for the, the link to the service, so whatever that service is. So if you're talking about a five or six month um, period of time, uh, if they satisfied those five prerequisites to reemployment, that employee, um, it, you know, of course, this is not in place now, but it, it could be, uh, would then provide that advance notice. They would be take an absence based on their service member service, um, and then you know have to uh, apply for reemployment within a timely time, and then they would be able to have, as 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 Director Denton says, take a knee, basically take a time out from work because. Perhaps they have young children at home, and perhaps they rely on their service member spouse to support uh, their raising of those children. Or perhaps they have a sick family member at home. You know, they just need to take a knee, as, as Director Denton said. And so USARA would enable them to do that and then return to the position they would have been in had they never left. Does anyone? Oh. Yeah, I'll give you a quick story. So. Uh, Paul mentioned FEMLA, Federal, uh, Family Medical Leave Act, for those who are not familiar with that term, right? Family Medical Leave Act. It's an important act for our military spouses. Oftentimes, they're not aware of the resource that exists as part of Department of Labor resource. Uh, but to your point, uh, Ivan, I had a story from a military spouse who was an educator uh, right up the road at one of our military bases. She had two children who were exceptional family members. Her spouse was deployed. She had to take time off to take care of those two. They were both under age seven. She had to take care of them too by herself, but because she took time off, she lost her job. So just imagine if we had the protections for that spouse, right, to help her keep her job. Not only, not only that, the financial stability that she needed to have to continue to, to support her family and those exceptional family member children. We have some other Any other up. questions? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, Hugo Lenza from Rally Point, Army veteran, and I had a spouse, have a spouse, who had challenges when we were in the military with employment. Um, m mine's a two-part question. Uh, do companies feel or does the private sector feel that USERA is imposed on them? Is it, is it kind of a good relationship that companies have with USERA? And then the second part is, is DOD on board with this? This is great. Um, but is it, how difficult do we think it's going to be to, to make this happen? So I'll, I'll go to the first part, and then I'll let Julian answer the second part. So the first part is one of the things that we do as part of the USARA process is inform and educate people, right? The majority of the time when we get cases, uh, and we've got all of, all of our uh, lead investigators here, we have people here who uh, spend a lot of their time educating corporations about the importance of USARA. And oftentimes when a case comes, it's because there's a lack of 
knowledge about the USERRA process and what it does to protect the company, but also the individual. And so we spend a lot of time not only investigating cases, but a lot of time pro providing presentations to industries. We even provide a presentation, one of our uh, folks provided a presentation at the Society of Human Resource Managers to talk about the importance of, of uh, protections that are enforced through the USERRA process. So a lot of education goes into that, not only uh, here, of course, in DC, but across the entire country. So it is important for our employers to understand what USERRA does and how it would be impacted through this program. And so I just want to echo what Paul said earlier during his presentation, and that this is one of the things that's highlighted in VETS' 24 con Congressional Budget Justification. So this is a priority proposal that we have and that we are putting out um, in the hopes that we can solidify and finalize proposal that the full executive branch can get behind and support. Uh, we are not quite there yet, um, but one of the reasons why we are having the event today is, is really to celebrate the month that we're in, uh, celebrate the spouses that uh, have supported our service members throughout their entire service, but also to make their stories more apparent and more aware to those who are outside of the military community. Uh, to your point about DOD, DOD is keenly aware of this issue. They have that survey or they have found that disproportionately military spouses are unemployed, and that is a problem. And so while I cannot speak for DOD, I think for them keenly aware of readiness issues, recruitment issues, and retention issues, I would like to think that this is something they would be concerned about. Uh, yes, uh, Joel Garrison, um, I don't speak for DOD either, but 32-year uh, uh, career service member, uh, worked this issue, veterans, mil military spouse unemployment for many, many, many years. And I can absolutely tell you, I would love to hear your statistics on how effective USARA is. Um, my experience being a commander and dealing with my Fort National Guard unit before I went on active duty is that USARA probably works for only about 2% of the population. The other 98% of the population they face a hostile work environment because of you, Sarah. Employers look at it as being toxic and they run away from it. That's why you have to, I had so many people that I dealt with, so many of my soldiers that I dealt with that would not even put that they were National Guard on their resumes because the way to get around you, Sarah, is just don't deal with the, a military member. So I'd be very curious as to the stats that back up the effectiveness of USERRA. Um, I think it's good that we have those laws, but I think the more that you try to put them out there and force employers n to do what they should be doing anyway, I think that it actually muddies the water. Thank you, thank you for that question and for your service. Uh, so, so before I um, before I joined uh, Vets, uh, one, one of my prior lives was in the uh, U.S. Army Reserve Judge Advocate General's Corps. And one of our primary missions was doing all those unit briefings. You know, we always did them at the uh, usually at the holiday party or the the the, the uh, summer uh, picnic. Uh, but one of the briefings we always gave was a USARA briefing to ensure that our service members knew their rights under USARA. And so you, I'm sure you've experienced this. We often did it in conjunction with our colleagues at ESGR. You know, always there was a volunteer ombudsman that joined us for those briefings. They were usually a retired service member and they shared their experience and they explained the value of the protections under USARA. And so here at VETS, we have a very robust outreach program for both service members and employers. And we find that employers are generally very uh, accepting and patriotic of the uh, of, of their service member employees and so uh, we see it as an education and an outreach uh, issue and 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 we do that and we try to tackle that through uh, the compliance assistance that we provide either proactively by going out visiting employers and organizations uh, organizations such as SHRM um, 
organizations such through the Chamber of Commerce or other types of industry groups to try to educate employers and their representatives. Uh, myself and Keenan Torrens, our Director of Compliance and Investigations, have actually spoken to a number of legal organizations to ensure that the Council for Employers understand uh, the responsibilities under USERRA. And so, USERRA has those anti-discrimination, anti-retaliation provisions. Um, VETS receives complaints, claims of folks that say that their, um, that their rights have been violated under USERRA. We report those annually in an annual report to Congress. We average about 1,000 uh, violations reported each year. Uh, we have a uh, high success rate in resolving those claims in which we find to have been substantiated by the evidence. I believe we are well over 85% of those claims uh, that, are, that we find to have been substantiated by the evidence, we are able to resolve for service members. We also work closely with our partners at the Department of Justice and the Office of Special Counsel. If a, uh, a service member, a veteran, wants to have their case referred for litigation or consideration of litigation to the, the Department of Justice or the Office of Special Counsel, we work closely with those agencies and they have a very successful uh, resolution rate as well. And so I think what I'm hearing is there's still, you know, there's still an education and outreach uh, work that needs to be done, and we're prepared to do it. Thank you. Question? Apparently I'm Mike Challenged. Hey, Mike Frew with the Veterans Benefits Administration. And a, a comment first, and one, that I want to say, I, I like the approach with you, Sarah. I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting extension for, as you say, family members serve. I grew up in uh, an army family. We moved a zillion times, and and I know what it was like for my mom, who didn't work the whole time. That that my dad was serving overseas. She didn't work in Japan. Um, wartime. She didn't work during wartime. It was just a different life. And I like the idea of you, Sarah. But how effective will it be for? active duty if you're not returning to the same job or you're not returning to the same location. I'm a federal agency. We employ a lot and we're, you know, even though we're veterans, we certainly focus a lot on service members and we're trying to do a lot more with military spouse hiring and finding jobs that can be location independent or geographically independent. And it was challenging, less challenging post COVID than it was pre COVID. So good luck, Megan, with, with, a, a remote position because I think there's a lot more now, but there's still, you know, it, it's different. And I think employers are challenged even with us to say what type of position can we develop someone who will be in a different location all the time. And we're national and a lot of employment is local. A little bit here, Mike, good to see you. Uh, one of the things that I think is important about this is that what we also hope to to initiate, right, is getting employers to be more creative and how they continue to retain the military spouses in this case, right? When you look at the innovative tools that corporations used because of the pandemic to keep the lights on, right? And one of the things my team's always heard me say is, you know, who would ever thought the federal government could go fully remote? Well, they did it, and the country still operated, right? And so when you look at how organizations continue to evolve, one of the ways we hope that they do what the hope will happen is that companies will look at innovative ways to help retain those military spouses, right? By letting them be virtual for a while, be a hybrid environment, things like that, that we know have worked in this current environment we're in as we come out of. So we're trying to help educate employers to really understand the value of retention, but also the value of innovation when it comes to trying to keep those spouses employed, whether they have to change duty stations or they have to take some time off. But I'll let uh, Paul add some data here. Thanks, sir. Uh, so uh, I just want to echo um, what the Assistant Secretary said about those kind of creative ways to have workplace flexibilities. And I think um, by having USARA protections for military spouses, it incentivizes employers to find creative ways to, knowing that they have to re-employ them down the road, find creative ways to keep them employed during the absence. And maybe some of those workplace flexibilities that we learned, you know, one of the few good things we learned during the pandemic is that there's these other opportunities for work that, that could, be, could be further utilized. But, um, but you raise a good point about the active component, like military spouse of the active component, because up until now, 
even though USERRA does apply to the active component, uh, there's really not a lot of use for the reemployment protections during the active service, right? Because they're in the, they're, they're, their job is in, uh, serving at, in the act, on active duty. So, so we think there are opportunities there to think about the absences that are created during that active duty service, right? So, so right now you have you know, initial entry, right? So if somebody decides they're gonna do one tour, uh, maybe it's a four-year tour, so they, they would not exceed the five-year cumulative service limit, so they would have those USERRA protections. Um, maybe they are uh, a civilian employee who decides to reassess into the active component and, and do a, a tour that does not exceed that five-year limit. They would have uh, reemployment protections. But the good question is, how do you apply that to um, a service member who is serving for longer than that and extending that to their military spouse. And I think then you start looking at what kind of absences do active, the, the, the spouses of the active component face? And we heard a lot about them during the panel, right? We heard about deployments, right? So we have basically an absence from the official duty station. And, and so we think that there's room there to create a protection for that absence that is created, even for the active component. And there are other periods, training, you know, going TDY, temporary duty for training. There's an absence from a duty station for that. Um, uh, and and to, a, to a certain extent, we heard about the, the PCS move, right? And if had, had we known that they would be returning to that location, it would have been nice to have those USERRA protections to be able to go back to that job that they vacated. So I think there are creative ways to apply reemployment protections to the military spouses of the active component. And, and we have some ideas, and we're hoping to be able to implement them. Thank you for the question, and thank you for your family service. I need to stand up because I'm short, and I want to make sure I address everybody. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. My name is Lloyd Calderon. I chair the Interagency Veterans Advisory Council. And the thing I want to um, just kind of point out is government has answers, and they have money, right? But they don't have all the answers. And I see a lot of senior people here. So I would encourage you, and I would encourage exactly what the Secretary is doing, is think out of the box. It's, there's a cultural uh, shift that we have to deal with. Employment is important. And um, we, one, we don't have just one item, right? We don't just have a wrench or one screwdriver. We have a variety of tools. And this is one of the tools. USERRA is a great tool to have. Employee resource groups. And I would encourage, you know, Mr. Secretary, you and I had that conversation a few weeks ago. Networking, y'all said it this, this, this afternoon, this morning. Uh, who, get to know people, right? And make sure you have an employee resource group in your respective agency that's proactive and professional so that folks can network effectively. And a plug for my agency, you know, we're looking for remote workers right now. So if uh, you, you, you need an employment, look me up. <laughs> Do you have a card? Sure. I think we have time for one more. Oh, okay. So Hi, um, I'm Marie Obiekwe. I'm with ESGR, a, t a Department of Defense Agency. And I just wanted to make a comment uh, that, uh, yes, we um, in ESGR, uh, in DOD, we are on board um, uh, with this. I work um, um, with Ombudsman Services. And in Ombudsman Services, we field uh, almost 20,000 questions um, and inquiries from service members and their spouses. One of the things I want you to know is that though this is not in place yet, it is already an expectation. We already receive calls from spouses um, thinking that they already have this um, this protection. So we are on board. We are looking forward to this being passed. Um, and we are um, looking forward to championing this along with DOD, uh, DOL. I'm sorry. Excellent. And then there was one more question, Julie. Also, y'all, Julie is also a military spouse who works at DOL Vets, and she is. If you know about the community, military spouse community, she just came up here and got me a Gatorade and Tylenol because I had a bit of a headache. So Big shout out to Julie, who's amazing, and taking care of military spouses at work. Thanks, Carla. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, I guess my only question is, I mean, obviously I work at this wonderful agency, and I'm so grateful 
um, to kind of come, circle, uh, come full circle. I'm a Navy veteran. I'm a Navy spouse. Um, my son is actually joining the Army in two short months, so I really come the full uh, roundabout. But my real question is, uh, and something that especially resonated with me, uh, is when she's talking about anxiety and depression and how hard that is, um, what is being done for those who have that kind of issue? Like, how are you reaching out to them to tell them about these resources? Because they may not advocate for themselves. So being a seasoned spouse, I know that like, I have to search for resources. I have to do the digging. I have to do all the things. But newer spouses with those issues uh, don't feel that empowerment, especially brand new spouses moving to a new base who are far away from their families and uh, don't have the friendships yet. Like, what is being done to tell them that they have these resources? Like, the ones who are leaving their jobs and they're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? How are you reaching out to them? I'll take this, and then if anybody else wants to add something. So, so, Julie, thanks for that question. I think that's important because one of the things that's often lost uh, in the conversation is that people do not know these resources exist, as you mentioned. And one of the things we try to do at the agency here is ensure that everybody knows that our programs exist. And that's why we're having this conversation in the first place. But in partnership with our federal partners, right, DOD, the VA, Small Business Administration, all of us, ESGR, who work together with us, when we talk about the resources that we provide our service members who are transitioning out uh, through the TAP classes, through our Employment Navigator Partnership Pilot, through our off-base transition training program, through our transition employment assistance for military spouses. So trying to get these resources uh, to the military spouse community is important for us. And that's why I mentioned having military spouses go to the TAP classes with their service member is inherently important. So they understand that these things exist to support them, understanding that within labor alone, we have other resources, not just USERA. We have Workforce Innovation Opportunity Acts. We have wagner Pizer. We have um, the Federal Medical Leave Act. All these different Department of Labor resources, to be quite honest, I didn't even know existed, and I thought I knew enough when I came to this job. And uh, now understanding with the whole of labor, the resources that we have to support the military spouse community is very, very encompassing, but oftentimes people don't understand that these resources exist. So one of our goals at the agency is to ensure that we are constantly sharing this information. We're partnering with organizations all across the entire country to ensure that they know what we do. We're also testifying on Capitol Hill to ensure that Congress also understands what we do that's separate from my good friends and colleagues at the VA, but also they understand the value of our resources, how impactful they are to the employment possibilities of our service members who are transitioning out, our guard reserve, our military spouses. So that's what we're trying to do, and that's why we had this conversation that's well overdue. Anything to add? Yeah. So I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't mention, at least for a second time, the congressional budget justification. And so uh, with all the resources that Assistant Secretary Rodriguez just listed, we are pushing out this message. But also in this budget justification, we are asking for resources to help us inform and educate folks around the country, those newer spouses, as you mentioned, the business community, those spouses who have been spouses for uh, you know, many years. Uh, we have to get the word out, and we have to make sure people understand what the law is. Uh, we're still going to fill those inquiries uh, if folks have questions, but we want to make sure folks have the information, they're informed, so they can reach out to us when they think their rights have been violated. And I'll add a little bit to um, to Julie's question. I think kind of being an underrepresented group and we don't really belong to DOD and we don't belong to VA and finding our own resources, we kind of have to mobilize ourselves on base and help one another out. It is something that we do often and not just for the military spouse community. We show up when there are mishaps on bases. We show up um, to fill in the gaps where there is uh, nothing for us to take care of one another. So I think that is one way that we definitely reach out to one another. All right. Thank you all. Okay. I'm going to just real quick, everyone, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And our goal here is to ensure that nobody ever feels, nobody who's ever worn the uniform ever feels like they cannot be proud of that service whether they're guard, active duty, period. They should never be 
uh, ashamed of that service. They should never be reluctant to tell someone that they served in uniform. And our goal is to make sure that that never happens. On top of that, our military spouses should never have the same issue either. They should never be reluctant or have the uh, uh, fear that because of their service, as Paul mentioned, they serve also, have the fear that they're not going to find a job or have a job that's uh, supported because of the companies, because they've served along their spouse. And so that's one of our goals here is to make sure that people understand the value of resources like you, Sarah. The one thing that I'll also add is that on part of, or one thing that we didn't mention as part of you, Sarah, is that if there's no resolution, we have the Department of Justice as partners. And so that resolution, that case can be escalated through the Department of Justice also if that individual feels like that was not uh, resolved. And so part of the ability to support someone who feels like he or she's been discriminated lies within the law itself, but also within the collective partnerships that we have and the work that we do every day. And so I want to thank everybody, most importantly, thank our panelists who came up and shared their stories with us and who were vulnerable with those stories because they are impactful. They tell the story that, is res that resonates across our country, across our military every single day. And I can't thank them enough for coming up and sharing that uh, important story. But also, thank everybody for joining us online, in person. We have a lot of work to do, and it takes a village. We've all heard that term. It takes a village to do this. All of our federal partners, all of our members up on the Hill who really want to find ways to continue to support this, but more importantly, because of our men and women who serve and their families are so right along with them, this is long overdue, and we want to continue to push the ball forward uh, with everyone's help. So thank you all again for joining us. It's a really, really important conversation, and thanks to all of our military spouses on Military Spouse Appreciation Day. So thank you all.